Okay. So bringing it back. I'd like to hear how, for those of you in the role of listener, what did you notice? How did this compare? Yes. Okay, much easier, not so much energy. It flowed. So not only was it easier, but you actually had a better understanding of what was important to her and what her needs were separate from what your agenda was. Yeah, what else? Yes, David. Um, it seemed that, you know, she generated many of the ideas already, so it was interesting to hear what she had already, the thought process she's already gone through in terms of making the change. So you didn't feel like you were having to give her ideas because she had generated a whole lot already herself, and they were, it sounds like, worthwhile ideas to explore. Yeah. Anything else we, we noticed, those of you in the role of listener? Now, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know if it's just because we don't know each other yet or if you guys are just the nicest people on the planet. I, I have a side of me, I really like to tell people what to do. And so when I'm in the role of listening, sometimes I have to bite my tongue because I really want to say, well, but have you considered, and then, but I don't hear anybody acknowledging that. I'm just going to assume you all are amazing, and it has nothing to do with not wanting to show yourself in front of the rest of the group. How about in the role of speaker? What did you notice? What, what was helpful in, in this go around? In the role of speaker, what made it easier or better for you? Okay, so you were able to take the time to stop and really consider why is this meaningful to you and even begin to, to problem solve about how would I get to a plan and actually make it happen. Yeah, what else? Yes. So it actually drew out of you more discussion. Her, her not speaking and, and the nonverbal acceptance really gave you time to reflect on your own reasoning and what motivates you. Yeah. Anything else that we should take away from this exercise? Okay. So we'll, we'll make a note of that. I wonder with the folks we're working with if they have similar experiences. All right, let's, let's look at another video. See if I can do this, David. Woohoo! And then just expand the screen. This one's about five minutes. This was one of my mentors. So let me tell you what I normally do in this um, this interview, and we we'll talk for up to maybe 20 minutes or so. Normally, what I do is just give some feedback from all of those questionnaires that you answered last week, mm -hmm. and then we just talk together about that. So, um, but I always like to just start with wherever you would like to start as well. I am setting the focus, the agenda, but also providing flexibility for Sarah as I want to see where she wants to begin with the feedback. Had she just asked me to begin by giving her the feedback, I would have done that. But note that when I let her decide where to begin, I reinforce her autonomy and ability to self-reflect. It also allows me to hear her reaction to the questions she answered and hear if there is any concern on her part. I demonstrate that I am partnering with her. Um, yeah, I, that, I mean, like, when I was doing those questionnaires, it was weird because, I mean, I guess I don't really think about, like, you know, like, drinking being, like, this huge deal, and I don't mm -hmm. ever really think about, like, like, how much I drink, mm -hmm. um, and, like, 
fi- like filling out like how much I'm drinking every day was like, whoa, you know, uh-huh. like I just didn't ever really think about it. Like that I was like, if I try to actually count the drinks, it's kind of a lot. I mean, it's kind of a lot. You were pretty shocked at what you learned yeah. about your patterns. I use a complex reflection to emphasize Sarah's beginning awareness. Complex reflections pick up on the emotional impact for the client. They are deepening of the client's own self-reflection. Change comes when we begin to recognize that our current behavior is discrepant with how we see ourselves. Well, yeah, because, like, I also kind of thought that, like, I drank, like, about as much as my friends did. And then, like... I went back and I was like talking to my roommate about it and I was like telling her that, you know, I was drinking like, like 10 drinks on the weekends, like including Thursday. So like Thursday, Friday, Mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, Sarah, that's crazy. Like, that is crazy. Why are you know, like, where are you drinking this? And I was I was like, well, you know, like different places. And I, I guess, like, I don't know. My friends didn't, like, know. Anyway, it's, yeah, I don't know. It, yeah, this information has opened your eyes in some ways. And as you talked to your roommate about it, she was even shocked to know that you were drinking as much as you, as you realized when you did the questionnaire. Yeah, and, yeah, I guess it was just, like, I thought that everybody was like doing it, you mm-hmm. know, but that's not really what was going on. <laughs> yeah, the fact that your drinking stands out from others is clearly not something you had ever really taken into consideration before. Thus far, I am very careful about using the conversational style of following, focusing on demonstrating my understanding of Sarah's situation and allowing her to continue to talk. The two reflections I have done have picked up on and once again reinforced Sarah's alarm about her drinking. This is beginning to address the importance of her looking at the drinking by just reinforcing what she is already realizing. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So that was the thing that like was really the most weird about doing those okay. forms. Uh, one of the things uh, I mean, motivational interviewing did start out in the addictions field I'm and stop widely us there. used there as well as other fields now. Um, and what you guys notice in that little vignette? Yeah. No judgment whatsoever. She reflected back. She expanded on it with some complex reflections, but no judgment. Mm hmm. What else? Yeah. Okay, so the way she interacted with the client allowed it to come out of the client's mouth. It wasn't anything that came out of the provider's mouth had already been stated by the client. Yeah, yeah. What else? There's some nice little nuggets in this video that go along with some of the things we're gonna be talking about in terms of using motivational interviewing. Yes, so there wasn't like this blatant agenda on the part of the provider to get her to that was wrong or that was bad or you need to change. She really kind of went with where where the client was. And yet, she did keep the discussion focused on the drinking, which is really a key part of motivational interviewing that differs a bit from other client-centered approaches. If you think about some of the just other client-centered approaches to counseling, you, they're, they're, it's very much can go wherever. This is directed in that we're keeping it focused on the target behavior, whatever that target has been identified to be. And yet, we're not trying to wrap up the plan. We're letting that person get to their own plan. So that's a good point you made. Did I see another hand out there? Mm-hmm. 
lots of reflective listening. Yes. So the reflective listening really elicits from the client their own thoughts as they talk about what's wrong with this, why is this a problem for me? Yeah, that's heart and soul motivational interviewing. It, it, we talk about change talk and sustain talk. Change talk is any statement that argues towards making a change, any kind of statement. So the desire to make it, the ability to make that change, the reasons or the need to make that change, or commitment to change. Sustained talk is what keeps us stuck, the arguments against it. And what I'm hearing both of you guys kind of uh, refer to there is that the reflections actually serve to pull out that change talk. It, it, it allows that, that person not just to give a little bit, but they are compelled because of the silence to even give more. And that's what the research shows us is that and open-ended questions are great, but reflections give us more change talk than even those open-ended questions if we do it strategically. That's a, a good point. Anything else? All right. There we go. Yay. I'm learning. I put this as sort of a summary slide up here, um, and my little pictures help me remember. So the first thing that I really want to give you guys a sense of is the spirit of MI, because you could walk out of here and not remember any particular technique, but if you have the spirit of MI, you are on the right track. When we think about motivational interviewing, it's a very accepting, collaborative approach to working with somebody. So rather than you having to take on an authority or parental type of position, you are really walking alongside. I think of it as, as kind of a, a coaching style, if you will. You're, you're going to do this together. Um, it's very compassionate. And we are eliciting or evoking the, the movement towards change from the person in front of us. So, any of you fish? No fishermen. I don't fish much, maybe once every 10 years, but I, I, I remember camping, it was brilliant, in August in south of Naples in the 10,000 Islands. It was about 400 degrees outside and I've never seen so many mosquitoes in my life. But anyway, we had this fishing boat and we decided we were going to go fish for snook because that was going to be fun. And um, we had a trolling motor on our fishing boat. You know what a trolling motor is? It's a very, for those of you that aren't familiar with a trolling motor, it's a very quiet motor. It doesn't move you along so much as it just kind of keeps you going in a general direction. And when I think about motivational interviewing, we do have a direction in mind, and that's where the trolling comes in, but we're not the ones pushing it. We are, we are evoking that from the person that we're, we're talking to. So it keeps us in the right direction, but the person who's actually really driving the boat is the client. And so I'm a, I'm a visual person, I like trolling. Um, we're also gonna talk about ORs. We like acronyms in motivational interviewing. Um, these are the, the four kind of core tools that we use with motivational interviewing. We've already started talking about reflections and open-ended questions. Um, and then the processes. Not everybody when they, they lecture about motivational interviewing will talk about processes. I do it almost every time and I'll tell you why. It's my anchor. When I am talking to somebody and I am trying to keep my motivational interviewing hat on, keep the spirit, and I'm feeling stuck, so I think to myself, I'm reflecting and we're just kind of circling around and we're not getting anywhere. What the heck is happening? Or even worse, I'm talking to this person and they're pushing back and pushing back and pushing back. And I'm thinking, what is going on? Looking at the processes, and we'll do this, 
is so helpful in figuring out what to do next and where we might have taken a little bit of a wrong turn. What can we do to make it better? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the skills. And this is the part that my hope would be you can continue to work on building beyond this four hours this morning. There are two types of skills in motivational interviewing that have been identified. They're the relational skills. This is the stuff you guys are so good at. That empathy, that partnership, the collaboration, the connection. Very, very important. Very important. Probably at least, if not more so, than anything else. And then there's the technical skills, where we really are tuning our ears to hear when somebody's talking about making change or when they're arguing against making change. And how we respond to that can encourage them to move forward or can make them feel a little bit more stuck. I wanted to uh, give a little bit of a nod to trauma-informed services because I know you guys have been talking a lot about that, is that correct? And looking at that, and these marry well together. You know, when we look at trauma-informed services, and you guys know all this, we are thinking about the impact that violence, that victimization has on, on an individual's whole functioning. And how, how is it that when we're trying to help somebody, how is that playing a part in that? And we want to be aware of that as we, as we figure out how we're going to work with somebody. One of the, the things that, that is very key to trauma-informed services, but it's also very consistent with motivational interviewing, is that we see the person as a whole person. We're not breaking it down to symptoms. We're not pathologizing. We're really looking at how do we help this person find solutions, feel better. Let's get some alleviation from the symptoms. We look at them as a whole and functioning individual rather than somebody who's, who's broken or pieces and parts. And motivational interviewing does the same thing. And I have to tell you, that's the best part of, of what I do. Um, and I get to do that with a, as a health psychologist, too. We get to focus on not what's wrong with somebody. In fact, when we are coaching people in motivational interviewing, we don't ever talk about what, what went wrong. What happens when you talk about for yourself what you did wrong? What happens to your confidence? goes down. And we know there are two things that are really important for motivation. Somebody said the first one a few minutes ago, it's got to be important to you if you're going to be motivated to do something. It doesn't matter that your doctor or your teacher or your parent is telling you you need to do this. If it's not important to you, it's not going to happen. But the second thing that has, has to be there is confidence. That self-efficacy, knowing that if I try to do it, I'm going to actually be able to make a difference. I'll give you an example. I think I used this one last summer, which tells you I haven't resolved it yet. Um, as I get older, I am increasingly aware of the fact that I need to increase my physical activity level. Now, on the weekends, it's all good. The kids and I are running around. We bike. We kayak. We have a great time. We play soccer. I'm not worried about that. But during the work week, I know I also need to engage in physical activity because just the weekends is not enough. I can tell you all the reasons it's important for me. I'm getting older. I'm just settling a little. My, my body fat is increasing. I want to wear my old clothes. I want to keep up with my kids. I don't want to get osteoporosis. I, I want to stay healthy. I mean, so... How important is it to me? Pretty important. On a scale of 1 to 10, we might say a 9 or a 10, that I engage in regular physical activity. But here's the thing. Weekends are fine. But if you talk to me about during the week and you say, well, Beth, how confident are you that you can actually increase your physical activity during the work week? Now we're going to find a problem. I'm going to say something to you like, well, here's the thing. So I get up at like 5.30 in the morning, I get showered, I get ready, then I'm getting the kids out of bed and then trying again to get them out of bed and again and again and finally they get out of bed and we get dressed and then we get the lunches and then we find the lost shoes and we collect all the homework stuff and then we get in the car and we're only one or two minutes late to school and then I rush off to work and then I work my full day and then I rush and I go get the kids and then we go to extracurricular stuff, we do soccer or whatever it may be and then we try to get dinner on the table and try to get them in the shower and then we try to do the homework that didn't get done when it should have gotten done, and then we realize that things aren't washed for tomorrow, and so we don't have uniforms, so we do a quick little laundry. And then guess what? It's 10 o'clock at night. So how's my confidence for doing physical activity during the work week? Scale of 1 to 10, 10 being awesome. Yeah, it's way down there. I'm just not sure 
when I talk about it, how I'm going to really work in something formal. So in order for me to be motivated to, to increase my physical activity level, it's got to be important to me, which it is, and I got to be confident I can do something about it. And so one of the things that motivational interviewing focuses on, first of all, we try to figure out where is the person, is the issue importance or is the, the issue confidence? And if it's confidence, we really want to empower that person and help them see their strengths and how they can succeed. How have they succeeded in the past? What may help you to succeed? What are little things that you think you might be able to succeed at? That's what we do with motivational interviewing. And it's so tempting to say, let me give you an example. Let's say somebody says, well, I stopped smoking for three months, and then I started again. So it's really tempting to say, oh, what happened? And they say, oh, I was so stressed out, and I thought I could just get away with one, and then next thing you know, I was buying it by the carton, and it was out of control. So first of all, am I getting change talk or sustained talk there? Sustained talk, all the reasons they couldn't do it. Their confidence is going lower as they hear themselves talking. So I'm not helping at all. So what I really want to do is something along the lines of, wow, you quit smoking for three months. How'd you do that? What kept you going during those three months? That's impressive. Now we're focusing in on the strengths. It's that glass half full, half empty thing. But, but the research, that so much of the research on motivational interviewing is about the language and how much of a difference we can make in motivation depending on the language that we use. What we know is that if I took if I took a sheet of paper and on this side, so your left side, I put change talk. And on this side, I put sustain talk. And every time I hear a change talk statement, I put a hash mark on this side of the paper. And every time I hear a sustain talk argument against changing, I put a hash mark over here. What the research shows us, pure and simple, and we can do this in as short as little 20 minute segments, the more hash marks you have under change talk, so the more times your client makes statements that argue towards change about desirability, reasons, need, commitment, any of those kind of statements, the more likely it is that at some point down the road, they're going to successfully engage in that change. Maybe not with you, but at some point down the road it is predictive. The more sustained talk statements you have, the more it predicts they're not going to change. So it's not neutral. So if we are saying, oh, you started smoking again, what, what happened? And they're giving us sustained talk statements, that's not neutral. We, even though we're trying to help, we're actually making it less likely that they succeed at, at stopping smoking down the road. And we've had lots and lots of research that's just parsed it out, change talk versus sustained talk, and how does it look. Further on in the interview, and the longer you know the person, it becomes even more important to have more change talk and less sustained talk. In the beginning, you get a little bit of both because they don't know you yet. But as it goes on, it gets even more and more important. So we're always tuning our ears if we want to know how is it going. I'm talking to this parent or I'm talking to this, this child or I'm talking to somebody in the school system. How's it going? How am I doing? Am I using my skills? Listen to what you're getting back. If, they, if you're getting back statements about change from their mouths, you're doing exactly right. If you're getting sustained talk statements back, you may want to adjust your sales just a little bit. So you can always check in and see, how's it going? How am I doing? Do I want to shift gears a bit? And remembering that even though it may feel like we're being really kind by asking them what's wrong, too much of that actually predicts they're not going to engage in that change. Now, we don't want to sacrifice the connection, the engaging that we do with people either. So it's a balancing act, especially in the beginning, and we'll talk about that. So back to trauma-informed services. So we look at that whole person. We're looking at reducing symptoms. We're not looking at people as if, if they have pathology. We're looking at people in, in ways to how can we make it even better yet? Not what's wrong with you, but how can we make it even better yet? So as I said already, with the spirit of motivational interviewing, we have partnership. We have acceptance, and included in that is accurate empathy. 
Accurate empathy is, is really trying to understand from their perspective. We don't have to agree, but really trying to understand from their perspective what, what it is that they are experiencing. It's compassionate. So this is the opposite of tricking people. Sometimes people in the business field say, oh, motivational interviewing, it's my way of getting people to do what I want them to do. Or I could say, oh, I can use this with my kids and get them to do what I want them to do. No, because at the heart and soul, at the, at the base of it, at the core of it, it's compassionate and we are considering that individual's needs. It's not about our agenda. Ultimately, it's about what's best for them. And it's evoking. Uh, one of the things that we know about change talk is no matter how technically correct we may be for what we say, no matter how right we are, if it comes out of our mouths, it's not change talk. So it has to come out of the client's mouth, even if we're right. So the, here's the hard part about that, especially because like I'm in the medical field. So I like to give information. I like to give advice. I like to tell people things they don't know. It makes me feel smart. But that information, my giving it, does not, is not correlated with them changing down the road. It's not. Now that doesn't mean we don't give information if they need information, but that's not the part that predicts change. The part that predicts change is what comes out of their mouths. And so we keep that in mind. All right, so the spirit of motivational interviewing, we are focusing on what makes it even better yet. What goes well and how can we build on that? And when we are keeping a trauma-informed focus, we are looking at it from that same focus, which is how do we make things better, not what's wrong with you. All right? It's very personal, and the individual we're working with is the one who ultimately defines the agenda. And working with youth, that can be really challenging because sometimes their agendas are really way out there. So what, what, a lot of what we're doing is this dance where we're trying to find common ground. Um, rather than convincing them that what we want is what they need to want. I will give you a very brief example and then maybe we should take a break pretty soon. How many people need a break soon? Okay, good. So I'll, t I'll give you my example and we'll take a break. Um, again, this is a medical example just because that's where I spend a lot of time. I had this gentleman that was referred to me. Morbidly obese gentleman, um, chronic smoker, uh, was on oxygen because he had advanced COPD. And his physician was concerned because he's continuing to smoke and he's wearing oxygen, carrying around his little tank with him, and there's the obvious risk that he could explode, right? So he gets sent to me so I can fix him with my magic wand. So I'm talking to the guy. We know what the doctor's agenda is for him. What's the doctor's agenda? Quit smoking, right. Now, I kind of like that too. I don't like exploding patients. Um, so I'm talking to the guy, and it, it quickly becomes apparent that he don't want to quit smoking. So now I could just say, oh, well, and send him on his way. But that would not be true to form with motivational interviewing. So I talked to him. And as we talked, I'm thinking to myself, where can we find that shared agenda? We've got to find a shared agenda. Because if I start pushing smoking cessation on him right now, I'm going to lose him, right? We all know that. So what do I do? This is why he's sent to me. Because so he's at risk, and I'm supposed to do something about it. So what am I supposed to do? Because he does not want to quit smoking, and I don't want to lose the relationship with him. So as we began to talk, I'm listening and I'm listening, trying to figure out what does he want. And what eventually came out was what he wanted Remember I said he was morbidly obese, smoking oxygen, the whole thing. He lived in a trailer kind of at the top of a hill, and he had this long winding driveway, gravel driveway, that went down to the street. At the end of the driveway was a mailbox down by the street. So every day when he wanted to check his mail, this was a major ordeal. He couldn't breathe, he couldn't walk more than about 10 feet without being severely winded and having to rest. He had actually taken chairs, like those little plastic outdoor chairs, and every 10 feet he had put them along the side of the driveway. So that when he went to check his mail, every 10 feet he could sit down and rest. So he, what he told me that he wanted was to be able to get to his mailbox without having to stop every 10 feet, because it was such a big deal. So that was his agenda. 
Can I work with him on that? Absolutely, absolutely. So we did, saw him several times across several months. Guess what about three months later he decided would be one thing that he thought he might could do to help him get to his mailbox a little better? Smoking cessation. But it was on his terms, not on mine. It was his agenda. And had I forced it when it was just mine, I would have lost him. So the key when we're working with our clients is to find that shared agenda. What's important to the consumer? What's important to the person we're working with? And how can we join them on that? Now, sometimes I used to work in the emergency room, and I'd ha they'd always send people to me who were saying, if I don't get my painkillers, I'm going to kill myself. And they'd send them to Beth. So I was the nice person. Everybody loved me. So I'm looking for a shared agenda, though. Bottom line, I'm trying to connect with them and find something we can work on together. Certainly, it's not going to be convincing the provider to write the script for the opiates. That's not it. But that's what they want, is a script, right, for the painkillers. I'd like them to be healthy and live a happy life. So where might we find common ground? What might become, I don't know, but it's possible, what might become a shared agenda? Hmm? Anybody? What might be a shared agenda? I've got this person who wants a script for opiates. Yes, dealing with the pain. Yes. Now, that's not a simple answer. Nothing simple or you guys wouldn't be sitting here. You'd have it all wrapped up. But that's something we may be able to agree to work on together. And maybe it's not going to be super easy. It still may be a little bit bumpy, but at least we found a common shared goal. That's really important. And trauma-informed services take that into consideration. I love this quote, so I put this in on the slides. This is a newer slide. Motivational interviewing with someone is like entering their home. One should enter with respect, interest, and kindness. Affirm what is good and refrain from providing unsolicited advice and rearranging the furniture. So it's very respectful. And you think about successful treatment of trauma, it's about providing choices, very much the same. And about choosing what is it that's going to be our target for behavior change. So MI is dancing. If you feel like you're wrestling or poking your eyeballs out, it's probably not motivational interviewing. And who was it that said, I felt like I was putting a lot more effort and energy into this than the, the person on the receiving end. Red flag that you want to shift sales. I bet you you're getting a lot of sustained talk when that's happening. So we want to do something different when we're getting that kind of feedback, because we know we're making things worse if we keep heading in that direction. OK, let's stop there and take a break. You want to take, what, 10 minutes? Would that be OK? All right. But what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So, I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yeah. 
All right, welcome back to the next part of our presentation. I just want to do a quick reminder, um, just um, as engaged participants, we want to make sure we're putting aside like emails and reports and all that good stuff for the remainder of the morning. So I'll ask that we um, close down laptops and technology and we'll continue with our morning. Thanks. Okay, welcome back. So some misconceptions that we often carry with us, and I still am guilty of this, um, about change. One is that this person ought to change. So my guy walking around carrying his oxygen tank, smoking a couple pack of cigarettes today, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around why he wouldn't want to change. Or that kid that's going to blow his, his scholarship if he doesn't start showing up to school, it's really hard to understand why he doesn't want to change. But, but we have to remember that that's our agenda, not necessarily theirs. Clients are either motivated or not. If not, there's nothing we can do for them. What we know about motivation in reality is that it waxes and wanes for all of us. And it depends very much in part on the person with whom we're interacting. So that's good news and bad news. The good news is that it can change. The bad news is, is that when we are interacting with somebody who's ambivalent, we can have a profound effect on their motivation, just in how we interact with them. Now is the right or only time to change. You know, I, I've struggled with this a lot. I used to work in the emergency room and I had, I'd have patients who um, had things like suicidal ideation or really high risk behavior, some other type of high risk behavior. It was very, very hard for me not to want to grab that person and force them to be safe. Um, and with kids, that's especially relevant. Or with parents who are damaging their children by their behaviors. We want to just shake them. We want to do something. So when I'm, when I'm trying to decide how I'm going to how I'm going to approach a situation like that, I have to remind myself that I am trying to maximize the chances that this person does what's healthy. There are no guarantees. And if my wringing their neck or trying to push them really hard in the right direction, as well-meaning as that is, if that makes it worse, that may not be the choice I make. Sometimes that's more difficult than others. A tough approach is always best. This used to be kind of the going thought with substance abuse. You know, you got to get them to hit rock bottom, and then you can pull them back up. 20% of the time, that seemed to work. What we're now beginning to understand is that smaller subset, those are people who are already right there ready to make a change. They're already thinking about it. They're already considering it. And so going ahead and, and being tough and talking about plans and what needs to happen, that's OK, because that's where they are already. But then you got all these other folks out there that aren't there yet. And when we push them, a tough approach just causes oftentimes either the bobblehead or the pushback or some of those other things that we noticed in those exercises that we did. I don't think you guys struggle maybe quite as much with number five as some of the physicians that I work with. <laughs> I'm the expert and you should do what I tell you to do. I had one physician who was so angry when, when we said, you know, you're not the only expert here. The client, the family, they have a lot of expertise too. You guys probably know that better than anybody because you're working with the strengths that you find in those systems. And then number six, if the person decides not to change, the consultation has failed. Thank God this isn't true. It is such a relief when you are seeing somebody and you realize they are not ready to make a change. It is such a relief to be able to put that to the side. You don't have to give up on them. There are things you can do. There's conversations you can have that will help plant the seeds so that when they're ready to water those seeds, they can. But we don't have to just throw in the towel and we don't, want to, we don't have to force that seed to, to sprout if it's not ready. For me, that's a huge relief. All right. So bottom line is we can't, and we've already been talking about this, even though we may see how somebody may get some relief, they may feel better, they may improve their behavior, we can't impose that. That's our agenda. And so we, when we're looking at situations, when we're writing plans or deciding how things may go, we want to make sure that we are considering the agenda of the person or the system that we're working with. 
because if, if it's just ours, we're going to get that pushback. And, and we used to call that resistance. We don't call it resistance so much now because resistance suggests that there's a problem with the other person. They're resisting my perfection. <laughs> I had a plan and they wouldn't do it. It's like non-compliant. You're not being compliant with my bossiness. So we tr we're trying to change that language. We actually, we actually say dealing with discord. It's an interaction. It's not just the person sitting in front of us. Um, so we want to we want to support. We want to be advocates, and we want to we want to communicate both implicitly and explicitly that the person that ultimately makes those decisions is the one sitting in front of us. And so our behavior will communicate that, but we may also need to say that. You know, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, ultimately what you choose to do is entirely up to you. I'm here with you 10 minutes. You're with yourself the rest of your life. So how you choose to proceed, I recognize is yours. Absolutely, I have some concerns about this. But I recognize you're the one that makes these decisions. And that autonomy is part of that confidence. We talked about the importance in confidence. Supporting autonomy builds, builds that sense of self-efficacy. So we want to make that explicit as well as implicit. I want to talk a little bit about ambivalence because this is the heart and soul of MI. MI is not a panacea. It is not something that we use for everything. <clears throat> but it is a wonderful approach when people are ambivalent, when they're on the fence, when they have reasons for doing something and reasons for not doing something. When somebody looks like they're not motivated, it's not a, a black and white, motivated, not motivated. It's, it's really about more reasons for, more reasons against. I like to think of it as kind of like a scale. And it's very normal. I have a good friend who, um, after about eight tries, she finally was successful at quitting smoking. And so I think it's been like nine years now since she's had a cigarette. But she will tell you, and she's a high-functioning professional, she will tell you, if I could go and have a cigarette, just one, when I'm really stressed out and know that I wouldn't become a smoker again, I'd love it. And that's, that's, it's normal to have that ambivalence, even after we've made a change. And so we don't need to, to run from it as much as just try with our, our clients to really understand it. Um, when we argue the opposite side of an argument that someone is giving us, we've already talked about how that's likely to elicit sustained talk. Um, it's also kind of a trap because human nature is to argue the opposite. My daughter, again, being an example. So if I say to Emily, you need to take a shower, she's going to say, no, I don't. I'm going to say, you know, it's really cold today. You, I actually did say this. You probably want to find your sweatshirt. I don't need it. It's warm in the building. So that's human nature. Now, granted, my daughter has a bad case of it, but that's human nature. If you don't believe me, let me tell you a story. I, I might have told this last summer because it's one of my favorites. Let's imagine for a minute that I have a female friend who comes to me, a good friend, and she says, my boyfriend is driving me crazy. He moved in a year ago. He swore when he moved in he was going to get a job. I go to work every day, bust my butt, work long hours. When I come home at the end of the day, he is still sitting there in his boxer shorts in front of the TV playing video games. And I can't take it anymore. I've had it. I can't take it. So me being the good friend, what do I tell her? Dump the loser. You're better than that, right? You deserve more. You don't have to put up with this. Knowing human nature, what does she say to me? But I love him. He gets me. I can't imagine my life without him. She's going to argue the other side. We know this. We all know this. So if I, if I just said, OK, I'm going to outsmart the system. So she's saying, yeah, boxer shorts, video games, can't take it anymore. In fact, she says to me, you know what happened last night? I'd been working all day long. I come in. He's sitting there playing video games. He pauses for a minute, looks up at me. And you know what he had the gall to say? What's for dinner? Exactly. So let's say I think, all right, I'm going to outsmart her. And I say, well, you know, 
you might want to cut him a little bit of slack because I think you know his heart is in the right place. Remember last year when you had the stomach bug and he made you that ginger tea and and brought it to you and I mean I think I think he cares. Maybe you, you want to give him another chance. What is she gonna say? You don't get it. You're not the one living with him. Tea? That's going to make me stay with him after a year of unemployment? I don't think so. She's going to argue the other side. It's human nature. We know this. And yet, if you have a student who's doing something that is not good for them, what's the first thing you do? Tell them to stop it. Right. And yet we know human nature is, they're going to tell you why they can't, they won't, they shouldn't, or you're wrong. Human nature. So we want to tuck that piece of information away, not just because we don't want to hear the other side argued, but we know that defense of the status quo elicits that sustained talk, and the more of that we get, thinking about that piece of paper, we are making it less likely that down the road they're going to change a behavior. So we're trying to help, we're making it worse. So we want to think about that. Sometimes, you guys, you noticed this when you were doing your exercises together. If it's a good friend, sometimes people will do it, or somebody that really values you. They may change for a little bit, but it's not, if it's not theirs, it's not going to stick. Um, we get the bobblehead. Yay, I'll do it. Just stop talking. We get the people who like to push back. Right? We have those as well. Bottom line is, no matter what the reaction is in these situations, nobody's benefiting. We're likely to get more sustained talk. We're going to say, because we're not feeling good about ourselves at this point as a provider, they're just not motivated. Or if it's the system we're working in, well, this system just doesn't care about the things I care about. Right? It's just easier to just write it off. So we want to figure out a way to tip those scales. We want to figure out a way to help that person out of their mouths talk about why the benefits of changing 